All righty. It is Wednesday evening. It is time for Bible study. As we continue in our study of the book of Revelation, a uh, fascinating book, and I, I believe that we are all learning a great deal and seeing the word in a different uh, viewpoint of which we had seen it before. And, uh, and of course, that's good, because now we're getting a, a deeper understanding of what God is saying and what God is speaking to us. Uh, and we're having an understanding of things that were previously uh, confusing and things that were, quite frankly, that we were probably afraid of, uh, and afraid of, of reading and afraid of understanding. But this uh, addressing this and beginning to understand more of it removes the fear and allows us to see it clear, more clearly, and also gives us a clear vision, uh, I'm sorry, a clear view into the message of God towards his people, uh, which is us, or at least we like to believe we are. Uh, so we could get right into it. Uh, let's go ahead and pray as we get started. And, and those of you who are coming in later and tuning in online, welcome. Uh, to Bible study, but let's go ahead and pray. Uh, God, our Father, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you for our continued discipline to study your word. We continue to pray that your word will touch us in a way that will help us become better, that it will, the seed will be planted on good ground that will produce much fruit, not, not because we want to be great, but that you will be glorified, God, and that we will have a better understanding of your word, that we will be equipped in season and out of season to uh, extol your praises, to witness to those who don't know who you are and give them a reason why we should trust you because our trust will be based in you. We love you, Lord, for what you do. We love you for what you have done. We remember the sacrifice on the cross and we do not take it for granted that you love us. We bless you in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, Again, good, good evening. Um, I want to see where we ended last week. I just put my little strap in the book, but I didn't make any notation uh, there. I think we were right around verse eight. That looks like where we finished. And uh, that makes sense uh, that we finished there. Uh, so we were, let me get my book here. It looks like we were finishing in verse eight, and this would have been of chapter, probably chapter eight. Yes, of chapter eight. So what, where we are now is the, the seals have been broken and uh, things have happened. Uh, the seals, the seven seals that were presented on the scroll, and we've, we've gone through what had happened so far, and we got to uh, verse eight and uh, see where the second angel uh, was sounding. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> These angels that have come and are going to enact the justice and vengeance of God upon the earth. And it's, uh, it's real interesting. We finished last week with the angel who had the censer, the golden censer, that contained the incense that typically in the in the worship in the tabernacle the incense is what we they burn to as a sweet aroma to god but he used this censer to scatter uh the the ashes onto the earth and to cause thunderings and lightnings and and so that's where we we were uh finishing up last week uh and, and the seven angels so we we got through the first angel sound uh, which was uh, hail and fire. And now we're getting into the second angel and we'll finish with the seven angels tonight. So let's, let's start reading at verse eight, uh, where we're going to pick up the study this evening. It says, this is in chapter eight, verse eight, Revelation chapter eight, verse eight. 
Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain mountain burning with fire was thrown into the, into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. And the last verse, verse 13, and I took and I heard, I looked and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. And we're going to talk specifically about that, that last angel who is uh, uh, saying woe, woe, woe uh, to, uh, to the, basically the inhabitants of earth. So here we are, verse eight. We have an angel, the second angel who's, who's about to sound. Uh, his his trumpet and let me go back to it in my book here uh the second angel sounded and it was a great mountain something like a great mountain so remember earlier in our study several weeks ago maybe even a, a couple of months ago it talked about the idea of understanding the language when we're trying to discern between literal and symbolic uh, and here again we are reminded with this because what he's saying is symbolic because he says this is something like a mountain. He didn't say specifically a mountain was going into, into the water. Something like a mountain had fallen into the water. Uh, okay, thank you, Valerie, for your notification. Uh, and so not a mountain, something like a mountain. And many theologians believe that this is a meteor or an asteroid that, it, that was ignited entering into the atmosphere and landed in the ocean. And uh, so that <coughs> is what we, we understand from a theological point of view. Uh, Chantel, can you pull up Exodus 7, verse 19 through 21? Exodus 7, verse 19 through 21. So something like an, uh, a mountain, which would probably be a big meteor that caught fire as it entered into the, our atmosphere. Uh, and when it hit into, into the water, this would most likely cause a tidal wave. And as a result, a third of the sea became blood. Now, this is, of course, when we, we know about the Old Testament, what happened in, during the Exodus, Moses turned the Nile into blood before the Exodus. And so we see in Exodus 7, 19 through, uh, Exodus 7, 19 through 21. Can you read that, please? The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and the canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff and in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. All right. And so this is essentially what happened in the Old Testament with Moses. And now we're seeing in Revelation, he's saying that this thing struck the ocean and a third of the sea became blood. And so as we go into uh, read that and go into verse nine, you would believe that because of this large meteor or as he says, this large something like a mountain uh, that much of the animals in the water would have died, not just from the impact, but from the result of all the stuff that happened, particularly turning to blood. They can breathe and process the water or the oxygen or water goes through their gills to give them oxygen, but they cannot process oxygen through blood. So a third, uh, as he says, to be exact of the animals, a third of them are going to die and a third of the boats on the water would destroy. This would include in our time and in, in place, oil freighters, oil platforms, freight ships, fishing boats, cruise ships, pleasure boats, yachts, whatever you got out there, paddleboard, canoe, a third of them will be destroyed. 
And just like the previous two trumpets, uh, they have earthquakes, fiery hail, mega comets, global fire. And remember that Jesus told us and in, in, in when he was talking to the disciples that this were the first, these first seals were just the beginning, just the beginning that this is going to get worse. This is not going to get better. It is just going to get worse. And uh, so he says, uh, in, in the previous the previous chapters and a couple of weeks ago, we were reading about the men who begged to die. Now there's literally nowhere to hide from God's wrath. Not even death will hide the sinners from what God is going to execute on earth. There's no way, no place to go. There's no place to hide. He is literally taking everything and every a, a place that people would try to be will be taken away from them and they're just going to be forced to deal with the punishment that is coming um lisa are you able to read today no okay Catherine, are you able yes Okay, Jeremiah 9, 15, get that one queued up, Jeremiah 9, 15. So now we get to verse 10 and 11, and uh, the third angel, the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the spring waters. Verse 11, the name of the star is Wormwood, a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. We're going to take these two verses together. Uh, so the third angel now has come and has blown his horn. Another big meteor or asteroid is falling. Is, uh, that is, I'm sorry, it's on fire, falls from heaven. And when it hits, a third of the Earth's water supply will be destroyed. Now, if you notice, the first mountain-like object fell into the ocean. This one is going to fall into fresh water and a third of the earth's water will be destroyed. And so if you really think about it, remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people were going into uh, Costco and, and uh, Sam's Club and they're trying to buy all this water and water was out. And then they when they got water available, they put a limit on it so people can do it. And I, I don't know if you uh, like me, but when you, when the water started being rationed then me and my wife would go together, I would take a cart and get what they tell me I could get. And she'd get a cart, take what she can get, go to the car, come back in the store, get some more of the stuff this is going to be worse than that. This, this will eclipse this uh, in a major way. The water that will be left will be undrinkable and poisonous because, and, and it says, because they called it wormwood. Uh, because the people need water, many people will drink the water, which is the wormwood, and will die. And wormwood is a poisonous plant used in some alcohol, but when consumed on its own, it will kill excuse me, it will kill. So Catherine, let's hear that Jeremiah, please. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, see, I will make this people eat bitter food and drink poison water. He's prophesying bitter food and poison water. And when you are thirsty, and you don't have any choice but to drink this wormwood, that's what you're gonna drink, even though it's gonna kill you because your body needs it. There's, there's no way you can not have it. Uh, they tell you how many days you can go without food, but you're on a limited amount of time that you can go without liquids. And it's got to be done. And Jeremiah prophesied about it. And so now we get to verse 12. Here we keep climbing with these angels. Uh, it says in verse 12, then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that the third of them were darkened and a third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. This is something that we can see now. When Jesus said this is just the beginning of the birth pains, we can see how this is changing. 
and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And things are being built upon on top of the problems we already had. It's not like you deal with this and this goes away, then the next thing happens and it goes away. You're dealing with uh, the third of the ocean turning to blood and all those animals dying. And obviously the stench is going to come from that. You're dealing with the fire that, uh, that's coming, uh, the, the fiery, the, the burning up the earth. You got to deal with the fresh water that's going. And now we have the fourth angel who's coming. He blows his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars. Uh, the purpose of one third of so many things that this kind of demonstrates, if we want to read into this, it, re it demonstrate that God's wrath and anger, but yet he still is willing to show mercy. You're going to be punished instead of being completely wiped out. I'm only taking one third of it. Two thirds can remain, but one third is gone you will not be able to deal with this and you'll be able to feel this pain. You'll be able to feel the rapture, you'll, um, the, the, the punishment, you'll feel the judgment, but yet I am going to spare some relief. One third is not total. It's kind of minor in the, in the realm of complete destruction. He's not doing mass destruction, just a little bit to make us uh, uh, feel uh, the pain. Isaac, can you pull up... Uh, Psalm 103, verse 8. Who's that on iPhone? Me. Me who? Carol Thomas. My mom. Okay. Uh, mom, then uh, you just said me so quickly. I didn't recognize. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 19. And Isaac. I'm sorry, uh -huh. Charles. Charles. Can you pull up Exodus 10, 21 through 23? Exodus 10, 21 through 23. So uh, as I was saying, he, he's showing some compassion, even in the midst of his anger, when he can do total destruction, he's showing restraint and not doing a complete and total wipe out of the earth and not doing a complete and total destruction of the water or a complete and total destruction of humanity. He's just making this judgment being felt so everybody knows that he's serious. Let's hear this uh, Psalm 103.8. Uh, 103.8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding with loving kindness. He is slow to anger, but once he gets going, you're going to feel it. But even when he gets going, he still shows restraint. Uh my feeling is that the wrath of this angel is directed at the celestial bodies. And when I say the celestial bodies, I'm talking about the sun, the moon, the stars. The reason why is because people have a tendency to worship these things. That, that's why he's first, he's destroying or attacking things that we actually need uh, that, you know, when a mountain falls into the ocean, we need the fish uh, we, we need to have the, the, the water come through. We need the water to power things when it falls into the springs and the rivers, these are waters that we need to drink. Uh, but yet here, even though we need the sunlight and the moon and the stars for various things for, uh, to how this planet continues to operate, people to have a tendency to worship celestial beings. So let's hear that Deuteronomy 4:19. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. Don't do it. This is the warning way back in Deuteronomy. Don't fall for it, as, or as we used to say, don't fall for the okie doke. The sun and the moon and the stars, mm -hmm. we have to understand are created uh, entities. They don't exist on their own. It, when we go back to Genesis, uh, we see that, that when it said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And then when they go through the whole thing of creation, he put the stars in the heavens. He put the sun to bring forth, to rule over the day. And then he put the moon to rule over the night. He created these things. And yet, 
people will actually go out and worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then here God in, in this with this angel uh, destroys a third of the moon, a third of the sun, and a third of the stars as a reminder that he is the creator. These things are created and are subject to him. So if you don't have an understanding that you were these people who are out there worshiping the sun or worshiping the moon don't have to realize or they're going to come to a realization very quickly, those things have no power outside of God allowing them to exist. And he's demonstrating that these created bodies are going to be subject to him just the same as we're subject to him. And if you're going to worship these creatures, you're going to see that the sun or the moon or the stars are no match for the creator this judgment will impact the earth because we will lose the light and the heat of the sun. The moon, which regulates our tides, could cause tidal waves. And this will cause major <clears throat> meteorological, botanical, and biological cycles or disrupt these major uh, uh, biological cycles. Uh, one third of the earth will be in darkness. And this is something that will happen, but it has all already happened. If we go back to Exodus 10, 21 through 23, uh, I believe that was Charles going to read that. Um, yeah, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness, which may, which, which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Uh, they did not. They did not see one another. Nor, nor did they. Nor, nor did anyone rise from from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. He he did this before to bring total darkness on a land. But if you listen to those words, or if you're reading the words that he wrote in Exodus 10, 21 through 23, he talks about a darkness that is so thick. I just want you to, to fathom this in your mind, a darkness so thick that you can feel it. Talking about the difference between light and day, the darkness is so thick that you can feel it. You can't see your hand in front of your face, but you can feel the darkness. That's the wrong. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, revelations. I've, 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 I've read it, you know, several times. And I've always took this in a spiritual sense. And when I say that, when I, when I, when I hear mountains and stars and seas, I'm thinking, I was thinking, you know, people like the, the Roman Catholic church and the people who are deceitful in the church, which, which leads which which leads people into darkness, and so when he begins to take things, when he begins to take these from us, and 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 allow us to be given spiritual darkness, because he's concerned. I felt he's always been concerned about my spiritual security, not my physical physical, you know, well being, because all of this stuff is going back where it came from, and so, am I wrong to think that he's talking on a on a symbolic level, on a symbolic level in Revelations, not a not a physical level. Ah, that's a very good question. That's something that uh, uh, we we've talked about uh, on the, on the weeks that you haven't been here. Uh, that part of the discussion that takes place with Revelation is: is it literal or is it symbolic? Mm -hmm. Now there there are clues that when we read this, that we understand that we can determine there are some things that are clearly symbolic and some things that are literal. So if, if in fact the whole thing is symbolic, then there would never be any need to, to write in symbolic terms if it's all symbolic. Like he, he says that something like a, a mountain was into the water, or I heard something like raging waters or i heard something like a thundering army those are are similes and and sim symbols of things then he writes i saw a or i saw this or there were there was an angel or these angels arose that gives us more of a literal so there's there are elements of literal and elements of sim symbolism 
Now, what we want to strive to do is as we continue to read and continue to study and continue to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament and see where these scriptures run parallel with what's in Revelation that we come to, because I my, my role is I am not going to tell you 100% that this is 100% literal or 100% spiritual. What, what I want to do is give you the tools to equip you to develop your, your discernment, to be able to understand and form your conclusion that when you read this, what is God saying to you? And come to that conclusion that, that, that you ask God to give you this wisdom and give you discernment that when you read these words and say, you know what, this is literal, just the same as Old Testament stuff was literal. That, so yes and no is is basically where yes and no some of it's symbolic some of it is literal okay, okay. thank you okay all right i love your questions i love them uh but he's talking about this darkness i mean and so we we have never experienced that type of darkness but we've seen uh, gone through many eclipses that we've seen it get darker in the middle of the day, some darkness comes, but we've never been in a place where a total eclipse where the sun was completely blocked out. We have been experiencing some things where we've seen disasters happen, where earthquakes have happened, tidal waves have happened, uh, volcanoes have erupted and put tons and tons of ash and smoke into the air that blocked out the sun and created a national hazard. We, we've experienced things like these, that that a lot of people take a symbolic and revelation we've actually experienced it we've just never experienced it on a scale that revelation describes and and as we continue to go tonight we're going to see some more things that are really that are really going to test you and and your your willingness to uh, either accept this as literal or accept it as symbolic, and and, w and we'll see. You'll you'll see it. It's it's unmistakable when we get there. But here here we we're talking about this darkness. Darkness is so thick that you can feel it. Now we can feel sunlight. That you know when you've been in the dark, and or you've been in a cold place, and you go outside when it's a hot day or it's a warm day, and you stick your arm out, you can feel the sunlight on your arm. Uh, many people like to go lay out in the sun because they want to feel the rays of the sun against their body. We know what it means to feel the sun. We know what it means to, to be warmed by the sun. You can feel it on your skin. Uh, you walk in from a dark movie into the light and your eyes have to adjust and everything is different. But what does darkness feel like? Can anybody even imagine or even begin to articulate what darkness could possibly feel like? I wouldn't want to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Uh, but this is what well, he's saying. You know, Brother Ron, I've, I've got a little experience of uh, what darkness feels like this past weekend. Mm -hmm. when I went fishing and where I was fishing at, there was absolutely no light. Mm. And I mean, you couldn't even... Uh, see your fishing pole in front of you. I mean, it was like black dark. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but could you feel it? Uh, yes, it was yeah. eerie. Yeah. <laughs> Very eerie. All right. Now, the last verse in this chapter, verse 13, he says he sees the angel who says, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let, let, let's read it specifically. And I looked and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So he heard this angel flying around saying the word whoa three times says it three times there have already been four angels and we know that there's a total of seven that are coming so we have the final three that are on deck I'm, I'm a baseball fan and now we're right in the beginning of baseball season so we got three angels that are on deck and he says whoa 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 we've already got four he's just like he's doing 
one for each angel. Uh, he's reminding us the four or we're bad. But what is it about these next three that are so bad that causes him to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And if you think about this for a second, matter of fact, uh, Chantel, pull up Matthew 24, 21 through 22. Just, it's, think about this, that, that we just experienced or we just read what he describes is supposed to happen to earth when the four, the first four angels blow their trumpet. And after the first four have blown their trumpet, he's now saying, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the next three that are coming. How much worse is this thing going to get? Chantel, let's hear that, please. Wait a minute, okay. For then there will be great distress, un, un, unequaled, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the, of the elect, those days would be shortened. So, okay. okay, so Jesus said previously, that these were the beginning of the sorrows. Depending on the translation, it'll say either the beginning of the sorrows or the beginning of the birth pains. But what he says now about these times, unless these days were shortened, no flesh will be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Is it... <sighs> these days could go longer. The suffering and the torture could go on longer but he's saying for the because of the elect's sake the people who believe that the ones who will come to christ because of their sake i'm going to shorten these days to to bring less suffering and remember i told you that this one third there's this specifically for the one third you're going to feel my wrath but i'm still granting you some grace i'm still granting you some mercy even though you deserve complete and total annihilation. And here he's again reminding us that people are going to suffer and they deserve to suffer the entirety of everything that God has to give. But for the sake of the elect, he's going to shorten the days. I'm still going to show grace even until the end. And John saying, uh, say, uh, and John writing that the angel saying, Whoa, 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 because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound off. So you just think about this before before the, these three angels jump off and what they're about to do. I want to do a quick review. Angel one brought about hail and fire mingled in blood. One third of the trees were burned. All of the green grass was destroyed. This is angel one. Angel two, a burning meteor turns one third of the sea to blood, one third of the fish died, one third of the boats destroyed. Angel three, a star falls, one third falls into the river, one third of the rivers and springs become wormwood and poison. And now angel four that had just happened, one third of the sun, one third of the moon were struck, one third of the stars, one third of the day did not shine. And this angel says, whoa, whoa, whoa. How bad are the last three angels going to be for mankind that is left on earth? Think about it. Unimaginable disasters have already hit the earth and the angel is saying, woe to you who remain. This is going to get worse. And now we get to chapter nine, which is a crazy chapter. First, I'll read the first six verses and we'll attack that and before we move on to the next, the first six verses. Then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. 
they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Those are the first six verses of chapter nine, Revelation chapter nine. So first four angels have already gone. We got three remaining. We get the first of the last three. He sounded and what he saw was an angel fallen from heaven. Uh, Brother James, can you read, pull up uh, Isaiah 14, chapter uh, verse two, 12 through 14, Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14. And um, Catherine, can you pull up Luke 10, 18? And then Charles, Luke 8, verse 30 through 32. So Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, Luke 10, verse 18, then Luke 8, verse 30 through 32. All right. So here's this, uh, he saw a star fallen from heaven now i want you to know I'm, I'm always paying attention and i want you to pay attention to how the words are written it is very important just like we understand or need to understand when he's using terms like like or ask as opposed to the literal i saw an angel or came did this here he says i, I saw a star fallen from heaven he didn't write that I saw a falling star. He says, but uh, uh, a star fallen, F-A-L-L-E-N, <clears throat> fallen from heaven, indicating this was an event that had already occurred. He's using a past tense in a present <laughs> sentence. So, we read it specifically. I saw a star fallen from heaven not falling fallen from heaven so let's hear that isaiah 14 isaiah 14 12 through 14 how you have fallen from heaven morning star son of the dawn you have been cast down to the earth you who once laid low the nations you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mounts of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zabon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So this is Isaiah prophesying about Satan's fall from heaven. And, and you hear those words. Everything in his wording is about pride, that he is he as a created being was trying to elevate himself on the level equal to God. Uh, and so he's writing about this. And so when we read this verse in chapter nine, verse one, this is the, the reference to Satan, the fallen angel, not the falling angel, but the fallen angel. So it is right for him to write that he saw the star fallen from heaven. Satan was called, or once upon a time, depending on where you've read it, you, the bright and morning star. Uh, so this, this is what he's describing. And so Isaiah tells us about it, that he saw it. His pride wanted to be equal to God. A created being uh, it thinks that he is as special as the creator. And Jesus tells a similar story to his disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Let's hear that. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay, so here Jesus is saying, I saw it. I was there when this happened. This star that you are seeing uh, or, or the fallen star that you are witnessing now uh, that ends up with the keys to the pit is the same star that fell way back in the beginning. I was present when this happened. 
This was just not, uh, and keep in mind, when he's describing this, he said with lightning, this was not a simple, uh, yo, dog, you got to bounce. Get get out my crib, you out of here. No, this was a violent uh, kicking out. that He had to get thrown out by force. Uh, and it, essentially, we can say he showed his entire butt before he got kicked out. And so he gets down or gets kicked out. And now he is given a key to the bottomless pit. He is given the keys, which means he didn't have the keys before, but now he's given the keys. God is always in control that Satan couldn't do it until God gave him the keys. So if we go into verse two, this fallen angel, this fallen star, open the pit and is really actually translated as the bottomless abyss. The bottomless abyss is mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation, nine times in, in the Bible, and is essentially a prison that has held demonic hordes of fallen angels. This place is one of the uh, severest, tor uh, severest places of torment and isolation. And so uh, let, let's look at a story. Uh, let's go to Luke 8. Let's read this story uh, about the, 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 de, de, how do they say, the uh, demoniac who Jesus cast out these, these uh, the, the demons. So Luke 8, 30 through 32. Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? He said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Okay, wait, stop right there, Brother Charles. Okay, so what I want to bring this up because we see here uh, the, the fallen star has the keys to the bottomless pit, the bottomless abyss, and that it has been locked and it is holding all of Satan's boys, all of his, his crew. And now Jesus is coming towards a man who is full of demons. Ask him who he is and they tell him. We are legion because we are many. And then pick up right before you got to the abyss part and keep reading, Charles. Uh, it says, let me back up. It says, and he begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding, feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. All right. So they, they are literally, the demons are faced face to face with Jesus and realizing who Jesus is, is begging him, do not send us to the abyss, which tells you how bad this place must be. They'd rather spend their life or whatever kind of life they have, send us to these pigs, let us go into this herd of swine as opposed to sending us to the abyss. So this place, this is a place that is obviously, if the demons don't even want to go, we're not, you know, this is worse than any prison that we can ever imagine. I don't know what the worst prison in America is. I don't know what the worst prison in the world is, but whatever it is, these demons didn't want to go. They, they're beseeching Jesus. And I want that to just sink in into your into your your mind for a quick second the demons are beseeching jesus they're not beseeching satan they're beseeching jesus cast us into these pigs instead of putting us into abyss there has to be some serious fear for them to go to the abyss and that really puts in our mind how horrible is this place how 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 bad must this abyss be? And so now here we are, Satan, who, is, uh, <laughs> who has the keys to let out his old crew. He's getting the band back together. And it gives us insight as why the angel cried, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because he knew the next thing that was going to happen is that the fallen star was going to be given the keys to the prison that has been <coughs> holding the worst of the worst of the worst of the demons, and they are going to be let out. And that tells you, I see why he's saying, whoa. And the gates open, the smoke arose so thick that the sun and the air were darkened because of it. 
And then we get to verse three. Out of the smoke, locusts came. This is out of the smoke. There's locusts came upon the earth. Locusts, if, if no one is familiar, are like grasshopper-like insects. They, they travel in swarms. And his history, modern history, has documented swarms of, of locusts that were so big that they completely covered an entire region. I think it was something like 250 square miles destroyed every piece of vegetation that was in the way. The, the swarm was so thick that it blocked out the sun for 200 miles, worse than any eclipse. That's how thick the swarm of locusts was. This was sometime, I think, in 1955, 1956, something like that. You can look it up. Uh, 250 square miles <laughs> of these locusts flying, and they were so thick that the swarm blocked out the sun. And they just destroyed every bit of vegetation in their path. Uh, these swarms can be get very large, they very destructive, and they destroy all vegetation in their path. They can literally destroy an economy because of their destructive nature. And it kind of gives you some insight because he didn't say that these were locusts. He said the, uh, how does he describe it? Uh, the, wait, let me not lie. I don't want to tell anybody a lie. Oh, he did say out of the smoke, locusts came from up from out of the earth. So this is when we think about this here. These are the worst of the worst of the demons that have been locked into the pit of hell. And they come out in the form of an insect that does nothing but destroy. It has a ravenous appetite and destroys everything it comes into contact with. And this is what has been released from this pit. Um, and so now we get to the intersection of literal and symbolic once again. Uh, he didn't say they were like locusts. He said out of the smoke were locusts. They were given a power as the scorpion. That gets symbolic. And as he said, uh, locusts and as the scorpion, what he sees is a created being that looks like a locust. It kind of looks like a locust and it has the power like a uh a scorpion. Now, when we think about the description of these crazy looking things, remember the seraphim back in Revelation 4, uh, when, when John described them, uh, there were four. One had, was like a lion. One was like a calf. One had the face of a man. One was like a flying eagle. They had six wings and they were full of eyes. This is, these were the four, the four beasts that were around the throne. The, they're kind of weird looking. So it's not too far out of the realm of biblical understanding to see these demons as locusts with the scorpion, uh, power of the scorpion. So we hear about these creatures coming from the smoke. It, it shouldn't be hard to visualize what he's saying. And, and the one thing that should be clear is that these locusts are related to Satan in some way because they come from the pit. Now, he says they are given the power of the scorpions of the earth. What does this mean? Well, it means that scorpions have a tail. You, everybody has probably seen a picture of a scorpion. Those of us who are actually Scorpios have that little, like to have, I have an actual scorpion at, on my desk at work. Uh, I, I'm, and don't get it wrong. I, I don't follow this astrological crap. I, I just like the idea, you know, they, they have it. I'm a Scorpio, so I say I'm a Scorpio, but I'm a child of God, ultimately. Uh, but the scorpions have a tail with a stinger attached that delivers venom to its victim. A person uh, stung by a young scorpion with a large dose of venom will cause a person to roll on the ground and foam at the mouth in extreme pain. These released demons in the form of locusts are able to inflict physical and more than likely spiritual pain on the people. They are out of the abyss and they're ready to resume what got them kicked out of heaven in the first place. They are now actually given permission to go out and attack the earth. And in verse four, this is further confirmation that these are not uh, just regular old locusts. Uh, they are commanded to not harm the grass or any green thing or tree, which is exactly what locusts attack, plants, 
this is how they feed. They're they they uh, what do they call these? They only eat plants. Omnivore? No, they're not omnivore. Herbivores. This is what they eat. But they're commanded not to harm the grass or any green thing or tree. But this is what they eat, and they are commanded not to harm these things. Now take note. <clears throat> can't read my writing uh these these animals for lack of a better word are kind of career criminals right they have to follow what god says satan may have set them free from the abyss but they have to listen to god that's key they've been freed from the abyss by satan but they are under God's command. They can't, they can't touch any person who has been sealed by God. I forgot to have somebody read Revelation 7, 3, 4. And remember that in Revelation 7, 3, 4? Uh, somebody pull that up. I could read it. Go for it. Saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servant of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Okay. So here we go. We, that was back in, in Revelation chapter 7. So these, these scorpions or these demons, the locusts, they can come. They can't eat any green thing. They can't touch the trees. They can't kill anybody. But they can, uh, they can attack any human that is not sealed by God. So if you're stuck here on earth, the key is to be sealed by God. They cannot touch those who are sealed but they can touch the unsealed, <laughs> which is frightening for those who, who don't believe in God. And in verse nine, uh, uh, verse five, now it tells us that they are, what they can't touch or destroy man. They're not allowed to kill, but they can torment those who are unsealed. And it says this will last for a period of five months. And the reason why it lasts for five months uh, is because this is the equivalent to the actual life cycle of a real locust, which is approximately five months. So for five months, these, these, these creatures are going to be released from the abyss that are going to uh, actually bring relentless and constant torture and torment upon mankind for five months. Five months. And then we get to verse six. Those that are being tormented will find no relief. This he literally says there are going to be people who want to die and cannot find it. Can you imagine somewhere facing all this torment, you decide to take a bullet to the dome, but you survive because God did not allow you to die? This is literally saying they're going to seek death and will not find it. They are going to literally be committing suicide and will be unsuccessful and they were still going to have to suffer torment you're going to put a bullet to the dome and survive and still be tormented by these locusts god is forcing sinners to deal with this and there will be no escape it should be clear right now why this angel's flying around saying whoa 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 of what's coming because this ain't pretty then we get to verse seven we got six minutes left verse seven let's uh we'll try to we'll try to get to verse 11 i think we can get there the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle on their heads were crowns of something like gold and their faces were like faces of men they had hair like women's hair and teeth like lion's teeth they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and they were stings, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, to hurt men five months. 
And they had as a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abad Abadadon, but in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. Verse seven is telling us how these demons appear. They appear as horses prepared for battle, which symbolizes this. Here we get this cross literal and symbolism. They're like horses prepared for battle, which symbolize strength and speed. They had crowns like gold, which indicates or symbolic of being conquerors. They had faces of men, which is symbolic of intelligence. They are fast and strong, battle tested and smart. This is what these demons have they, that are released from the bottomless abyss. Woe to the inhabitants of earth. Verse eight says they had hair like women, women's hair. Essentially, they're not gruesome looking. They, some theologians have written that they're attractive, but I really find it hard to believe you're going to look at this thing as attractive. They're just not going to be gruesome looking. The teeth of lions would indicate or be symbolic of their fierceness and cruelty that they're going to inflict upon humankind. Then we get to verse nine, and they have breastplates, which protect the vital organs, which is a symb symbolism of invincibility that with one of the, you see these things coming, you might be able to swat normal locusts with a tennis racket or a racquetball racket and kill it, but you're not going to be able to kill these things. The wing sound of chariots is the sound of approaching calamity. So you're dealing with a, 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 a fast and strong conqueror that's intelligent, not gruesome looking, fierce and cruel, invincible, and bringing about calamity. This is what is happening with this. And it says that they're going to be here for a season of five months. That's the time in which they're going to be here to torment all of humankind. Now, the angel of the bottomless pit, we saw his name. This is the king of the demon locusts. Real locusts travel in a swarm. You know, the earthly locusts that we have that travel in a swarm. They don't have any leadership structure. They just instinctively fly in a swarm and they just go and destroy. But these locusts answer to their king. Uh, Chantel, pull up Proverbs 30, 27. They, these, these locusts have their, their king and we saw the name. Uh, are you ready for Proverbs 30, 27? I'm sorry, I didn't give you that one earlier. Almost. Wait, wait, wait. Thirty twenty-seven, right? Yeah. Okay. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. So Solomon is talking about them. He's he's reinforcing the fact that locusts do not have leadership. They're they're the uh, bees have a queen and a hive. Uh, other insects and animals have a recognized leadership structure. We know who's the alpha male. That's where we get this term. We know who's the leader, the, the, the king, but locusts don't have this. But yet we see in Revelation, they are answering to a king. And, and the more they move and destroy on their own, but not these. The name in Hebrew and Greek translates to destroyer. Though those two names for their their uh, their king translates to destroyer, the destroyer is the leader of the locusts, the fallen angels that have been released from the bottomless abyss. The destroyer, and that was where we're going to end for tonight. That was just one woe. We still got two more woes to deal with uh, that John heard the angel say. Two more woes of, of dealing with this calamity that we're coming. Uh, Charles, you, you brought up a very good point about the, the or, or the question about the symbolism versus the literal part of, of Revelation. Uh, like I said, my, my role is not to tell you guys what to think, just to give you the tools to form your opinion. I will tell you 
that from my point of view, that I believe that what we are going to experience in Revelation or when we get to the end times will be uh, pretty much close to what has been written by John. That's just my personal belief. That doesn't mean it should influence any of you guys. Just saying that's what I personally believe that we are going to, whether we're in heaven or whether we're here on earth, we are going to be witnesses to what God's judgment is going to be on this earth. And I'm, I'm and the reason why I believe that it is going to be uh, literal is because God has to, he has to take action for the sin that continues to go on on this earth, that, that mankind's willful disobedience, mankind's willful action to, to continue to propagate evil around the world that we that we're witnessing in real time right now <laughs> you know we we got this clown putin over here doing whatever he's doing we got now people talking about china saying a war with the united states is inevitable uh, and then the bible says there are going to be wars and rumors of wars and uh, this and and it just it all seems like it's folding and becoming into that that whole thing of turning into this apocalypse that we've uh, that we've seen or read about over the years that will eventually become uh uh armageddon and this complete destruction of the earth uh through all the things that we're reading about in uh revelation but like i said that's my point of view but i want you guys to to look at revelation and read it read these old and new testament scriptures and see how they parallel and and form an opinion on from your frame of mind and your frame of thinking and and stick with it because you have formed that frame of mind through your study through your relationship and through your request for wisdom from god that's that's what i want amen so uh Anybody have anything before we wrap up in prayer tonight? Um, uh, my good neighbor, Roy, passed away this morning. And, uh, you know, oh. you know, just been a next door neighbor. And we talked many, many things in solving the, the world problem over the back fence. Now, I'm not talking about who's doing who, but you know, this in general talking about and, and I miss him so it, it broke my heart when I knew that he was feeling and he passed away, you know, at the age of 70, 78, he's about eight months older than me. But but he, he's gone home to rest. And it just I just want to say that that the, you know what the Bible say about the, a, a neighbor. Well uh, he he was he was a good neighbor, so it's I just want to say uh, bless him. Bless, well, his family, the one who left behind, include me, and so I, I just I just want to say that. But the name is Roy Roy Jen, Roy, Roy Davis, Leroy Davis. So those of you that, that could barely hear that, so this is our next my next next door neighbor, my parents, Roy Davis. It uh, had gotten sick. It just seemed like all out of all out of the blue, and has been lingering for some years, dealing with uh, whatever it was that attacked him, and finally succumbed to it this morning. Uh, so he has now uh, gone on uh, to the Lord. Uh, he was a man of faith, attended church on a regular basis when he could uh, prior to COVID. Uh, and I know that his health deteriorated, his mobility also deteriorated. Uh, so we want to definitely keep his family in prayer uh, as they deal with that, because he, he was married. Him, he and his wife uh, live next door uh, alone. They were obviously older. Uh, and so we pray for uh, her, his wife his wife that would be there by herself that she'll continue to be uh encouraged and taken care of and no harm you know i hate to see uh single elderly women uh living by themselves that are and especially but i know they have family so it's not like she's going to be alone alone 
but she'll spend enough time by herself that we need to keep her uh, lifted up in prayer so she'll be protected. Also have a, a member of my church who texted me today that uh, she's got a bulging disc, two bulging discs in her back and some swollen knit lymph nodes that she's going to have to go for a bone scan uh, next month. So we want to keep that family uh, lifted up in prayer as well, uh, especially her husband, because he's lost his father. Uh, his mother is ailing at right now. So he's kind of burning it on both ends, all traveling to, to take care of mom. And now if, if things go differently for his wife, he's got to worry about his wife and his mom at the same time. Uh, and so we got a lot of people who are out there going through some stuff. And we know that each of you have your own things that you're dealing with and uh, on your own, as one of my frat brothers says, living lives of quiet desperation, uh, trying not to be a burden to anybody else and never revealing what it is that you're going through for whatever the reason is. You know, I don't want people to know. I want folks in my business. I don't want people to think any kind of way about me. But the spirit knows the groanings of your heart. The word says that if you don't even know the words to pray, the spirit will groan for you. Uh, but those we keep you lifted up in prayer for those prayers that you have kept inside for whatever reason that you've kept there, that you no longer have to live a life of quiet desperation on your own to understand that there are people out there who do love you and care about you, who will pray with you and pray for you to lift you up, to encourage you and to love you so that you don't have to go through this by yourself. Nobody in the body of Christ should suffer alone uh, in silence by themselves. There's just too many of us uh, out here who, uh, um, who will love you. Now, granted, <laughs> some there are too many of us as flip wilson said in uptown saturday night got them loose lips they can't wait to hear what's going on so they can go out there and spread it that's where your discernment is going to have to come to know who is truly in the body of christ that i can talk to and share this with that they can pray with me and keep me lifted up and uh, and you will find that god will put those people in your life and you will be better for it. So let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can study your word, <clears throat> that we can get a greater understanding of what is to come, the, the end times of this earth, the end times of mankind, and what is there that we need to do to get our lives right so that we can be in, in, in heaven with you, that we can be protected from these times, that we don't have to go through the endure, the harsh torment and torture that is coming, that is going to befall this land. Lord, help us to be that light, to be that witness that we can show the world who we are and who we are in you, that they may want to become part of this body of believers, not because we go to the popular church, not because the pastor is the thorough famous bishop, but because we teach the truth of your word, because we love your word, and because we study your word. And so God, on this prayer call or this Bible study, we lift up people who are suffering in silence right now, living lives of quiet desperation. They kept their prayers and their sufferings and the things that they're going through, their anxieties and fears to themselves. We pray, God, that you will strengthen them, that you will put the people in their lives that they can trust and confide in, that they will have people who will continue to pray with them and lift them up, pray with them and pray for them, that they will get the strength to deal with the things that keep them in the closet from the things that they won't deal with uh, completely, that they will be cured, restored of all those things. We lift up the family of Roy Davis. We know that he was a man of God, that he believed in you, that he had confessed you as your Lord, uh, as his Lord and Savior. Uh, we pray for his family that he left behind, that they have some peace, the peace of the Holy Spirit that will keep them engulfed during this time, that even though he's not here, and even though that they will have times that they will miss him, but your presence, God, will be that comfort in that time of need that the tears that they shed will go away because they remember the good times. And Lord, we remember our member of the church who has a bulging disc in her back and the swollen nymph nodes that she goes for this bone scan right now in the name of Jesus. We declare and decree that this will not be cancer. This is just a temporary blip on the, on the radar screen that she will emerge with a, a good report from the doctor, that her body will be healed, that she will be restored, that she will continue to be the help me to her husband and the, the wife that he needs, and he will continue to be the husband that she needs, that they will continue to grow 
and study and pray and worship together in God. Bless all of us on this call, all of us on this stream, that we feel more of you in our lives and more of your peace and your strength, because it is you that helps us get through the day. And in these times where so many things that are going on, we need your peace. We need to avoid the confusion and believe and focus our center and our faith on you that we will be focused and that we will live lives of purpose. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Have a good night.